Welcome to everyone joining us around the world for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CARB's annual Alexandra Lecture, which will shortly be delivered by Toby Landau, KC Chartered Arbitrator, FCI ARB. My name is Catherine Dixon and I'm the Chief Executive Officer. I take this opportunity to warmly welcome Toby and CARB's President Jonathan Wood. It's wonderful to be able to host this lecture face to face whilst also allowing CIAB members from around the world to join us virtually. The title of this year's Alexander Lecture is International Investment Arbitration and the Search for Depoliticisation. Toby will examine the role of depoliticisation in the genesis, development and justification of international investment arbitration. The role of politics in international dispute resolution is complex and fascinating. Despite its importance, it is rarely addressed head on. The debate on the future of investor state arbitration and its possible reform continues. However, much of the current thinking fails to fully consider the broader geopolitical issues relevant to this form of dispute resolution. Toby will consider the role of politics in the genesis of investor state dispute settlement, ISDS, analyse the critical part that politics continues to play, assess how ISDS can negatively impact on the rule of law and suggest a fundamentally different course for possible reform. This, is, this field is being reshaped and given its crucial relationship with the rule of law and to international arbitration, developments in ISDS will no doubt have a significant impact on the future of international dispute resolution. I'm really excited to hear from Toby on this fascinating subject. However, before I formally introduce Toby, a few housekeeping issues. For in-person attendees, in case of a fire alarm, please follow the staff instructions, evacuate the building, and the meeting point is outside the main entrance at Bloomsbury Square Gardens. For virtual attendees, you can explore the virtual platform using the navigation bar on the top. During the session, use the chat on the right hand side of the screen. Please try using the chat, maybe tell us where you're from, um, and maybe tell us something about yourself. You can use the Q&A function to ask questions of the speaker. We will be taking virtual and in-person questions at the end. If you're struggling with anything, please use the help widget located at the bottom of your screen and or let us know in the chat. The lecture is being recorded and will be available on virtual platform immediately after the lecture and also on CIRB's YouTube channel. I'm, jo I'm joined today by Jonathan Wood, FCI ARB, President of CIRB. Jonathan will be moderating the, the Q&A discussion after the lecture. Jonathan will try to get through as many questions as possible, but please don't be disappointed if we don't have time for your question. Jonathan is an independent arbitrator with over 40 years experience in the field. Jonathan is the director of the London Chamber of Arbitration and Mediation and the chair of the International Arbitration at Reynolds Porter Chamberlain. He is a founding member of Legal UK and also the Virtual Arbitrations Forum and was the chair of the board of CR before being elected as president. He now gives me immense pleasure to introduce Toby Landau, KC, Chartered Arbitrator, FCI ARB. Toby is a barrister, advocate and arbitrator and a member of bars of the Bar of England and Wales, Singapore, New York, the British Virgin Islands and Northern Ireland. As counsel, he has argued hundreds of major international commercial investor state and interstate arbitrations, as well as groundbreaking cases in England, Singapore, Hong Kong, Pakistan and the Caribbean. He was the first KC to have been permanently called to the Singapore Bar and since April 2012 he's been a member of the panel of advisors to the Attorney General of Singapore. He's a visiting professor at King's College London, Vice President of SEAC, Court of Arbitration, member of the Governing Board of ICA, Vice Chair of the Saudi Centre for Commercial Arbitration, was the UK delegate at UC Trial Working Group on Arbitration, past director and court member of the LCIA, past member of the SCC board, 
drafted the Arbitration Act 1996, the Pakistan Arbitration International Investment Disputes Ordinance 2006, and the Mauritius International Arbitration Act 2008, as, many, as, as well as many other institutional rules. Welcome, Toby, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us this evening. Thank you. Toby. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening, or possibly good morning, depending on where you are. The Intag Valley is a remote mountainous region in the high Andes in northern Ecuador. It is an area of exquisite natural beauty, commanding mountains, lush, verdant valleys, rushing streams, a sea of flowers and flora, pure mountain air with no sounds but nature's own symphony. This is an area of worldwide biological and ecological importance, bordering the internationally recognized Kodakachi Kayapas Ecological Reserve, <laughs> with a huge diversity of birds and flowers. It's also home to about 17,000 people who live in small communities sparsely scattered amongst cloud forest and agricultural lands. They've lived there in their close bond with nature for generations, undisturbed, in their own paradise, growing tropical fruits, coffee, corn, beans, raising cows, pigs and chickens. These are quiet, peace-loving communities untouched. Untouched, that is, until 2003. In 2003, a company called Ascendant Copper, later renamed Copper Mesa, secured three concessions from the Ecuadorian government to conduct open case copper mining in the Intag Valley. This was a project with a potentially devastating ecological impact. The removal of sections of mountain, waste material to be dumped in the main river, forcible eviction of communities from their hereditary lands. Copper Mesa met with understandable local resistance. And in response, it adopted a shockingly aggressive stance, including hiring paramilitary forces. This led to extraordinary confrontations with the locals. There were running battles, there was use of tear gas, there were weapons, the locals were hurt, they were mistreated, some were taken away. A whole community was deeply traumatized and ultimately in view in part of the conduct of the investors, the Equatorian government canceled environmental licenses and canceled the concessions. And in 2008, Copper Mesa left Ecuador. And then in 2012, Copper Mesa sued Ecuador for alleged violations of the Canada-Ecuador BIT 1996. They sought massive damages for the project of about $73 million, including loss of future profits. Ecuador's case was that the investor was not in compliance with national laws. It sought to deploy human rights as part of its, part of its defense, and it put forward some witness statements from the locals who had suffered at the hands of the foreign investors' aggression. Now, ultimately, the investors succeeded in their claim, and Ecuador had an award against it for about $19.4 million, with a substantial reduction on account of the investors' conduct. This, however, is not a lecture about the substantive rights and wrongs of that decision. It's not a lecture about the treaty guarantees that Ecuador had offered foreign investors, because it had. It's not a lecture about the application of the standards in the treaty, which had been freely agreed. This is a lecture about process only, <coughs> just process, about the nature of the investor state arbitration process itself 
by which this dispute was addressed. And in particular, the aftermath of that process. Arbitration came and went. Council and arbitrators moved on to their next cases. What was left behind? What was its impact? What is the position now in the high Andes in Ecuador? There is a notable blind spot in our field because we never stop to look back at the actual arbitral aftermath as we move on to our next cases. Now for Copa Mesa and Ecuador, this is the subject of a new documentary which has yet to be formally released or will be released very shortly, entitled The Tribunal, directed by Dr. Malcolm Rogger, who actually, I'm happy to say, is in the audience, produced in association with the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, 2023. Dr. Rogger spent time in the Intag Valley listening to the locals' accounts of this whole experience. It is a fascinating, indeed unique glimpse into the investor state arbitration aftermath, and more particularly, the disastrous wake it has left, the enduring scars of the locals, the inflammation that the process itself actually brought to the issues at stake. Members of the local community spoke of this on, on, on the film, spoke of the sheer terror of the violent confrontations with the investors, the trauma of the impending destruction of their community. But what was more interesting, at least to me, was also what they spoke about in terms of the process, the arbitration process. They described a visit uh, by, by what, what they said were smartly dressed, what they thought were French or Swiss lawyers who asked for witness statements. It's, it's, it's a credit to Lalive, because apparently it was Lalive who was acting, and apparently their counsel was smartly dressed. But what they talked about was the experience of being told to travel thousands of miles away from their paradise to Washington, D.C., where under grey skies in a mass of nameless people all dressed in similar suits, they waited amidst the steel and glass of the World Bank building for an unknown tribunal to call them. And they waited and waited for days. And finally, they were told they were not needed. And so they were returned to their home, never understanding anything of the process or of the people involved, and never having a chance of actually explaining their story. And then there's a most poignant moment in this film, which, by the way, is, is open access for you. And there is a link which the Charlie Institute will provide where you can watch the film. There's a very poignant moment where one of the victims whose life had been changed permanently by the experience is shown the award, the award that was rendered in Copa Mesa and Ecuador. It's a 255 page document, as it happens, largely redacted. It's in English only. This lady can't read it. She's told that in this document, there are determinations as to what happened to her and her family and her people but she never contributed to that. She doesn't know who wrote it. She doesn't know how that came about. Ultimately, it's unreadable, it's incomprehensible, and it's alien. And the overwhelming reality on the ground is one now of enduring pain and trauma. One person says to the camera, if the arbitration would have been held here in Apuela, a huge crowd would have been there. It is the process itself which has failed it is leading to inevitable, fundamental mistrust, a consequent lack of faith in legitimacy. It's actually inflaming the situation itself. There's no answer to the people of Ecuador to say that the award is the necessary result of the application of objective legal criteria. It, it may well be, but that's no comfort. This isn't just about scars in popular opinion in Ecuador. This is a much bigger issue. There is an increasing category of case, not all cases, where ISDS, the ISDS arbitral process seems to be generating a similar wake wherever it goes. There are a long list of examples. Can I just say for the record here, 
that I've been slightly unfairly treated because my request for a four-hour Alexander lecture <laughs> uh, was summarily dismissed. Um, uh, that's another due process issue which will be for another day. So I'm going to give you just a shortened list of some examples, similar examples. Von Pezold and Zimbabwe. All these cases are very well known. In that case, claims were brought under the Swiss and German Zimbabwe BITs, arising out of the government's expropriation of estates owned by the claimants, which included forestry and agricultural businesses, in the context of Zimbabwe's 2000 land reform program. That program was a highly political and emotive topic. It was Zimbabwe President Robert Mugabe's policy, in, in, in fact, on which he came to power in 1980, to correct the post-colonial state of affairs at the time, whereby a small number of white commercial farmers in Zimbabwe owned a large majority of the farmland. The land reform program began with voluntary sellers and buyers, but patients ran out in Zimbabwe and it led to expropriation without compensation. And indeed, from the beginning of about 2000, there was a wave of popular anti-colonial emotion in Zimbabwe. Black settlers began invading and occupying predominantly white-owned farms. In the arbitration that was brought, Zimbabwe essentially conceded that there had been an expropriation, but they claimed that the acts were lawful and for a public purpose. The land was expropriated, it argued, because indigenous people remained disadvantaged given the, the slow pace of land reform. So what they're telling, what, what Zimbabwe is telling the tribunal is that there is a core political social imperative that needed to be addressed. The march of history, as it was called in Zimbabwe at the time, was a spontaneous movement amongst the indigenous people and the state said that couldn't simply be stopped. Now, in the result, the tribunal ruled in favor of the investors. Zimbabwe was ordered to make restitution and pay compensation. You can't really complain about the substance of, the, of that answer. That was the application of the principles that had been agreed in the treaty. And it's understandable uh, that um, from a technical point of view, this would be discrimination, this would be expropriation. But, this, but the actual result was the subject of condemnation afterwards by many, many portions of society. It was noted in particular that the ISDS tribunal had rejected an application from four indigenous communities of Zimbabwe to file an amicus submission. So indigenous communities wanted to put their position before the tribunal. The tribunal refused. They did so on a basis that's perfectly understandable to practitioners in the field. The indigenous in, uh, uh, potential interveners wanted to raise human rights issues. They wanted to raise broad political issues. They wanted to raise historical issues. And the answer from the tribunal, those are not live issues in the actual dispute under the treaty. And therefore, we're not gonna give you a day in court to hear you. And that meant that the award proceeded and it was condemned subsequently for being blind to the essential socio-political context of the dispute. One commentator, Lamoli, has said, whereas one can agree with the tribunal that non-discrimination must be upheld also when white populations are the target of persecution, the perplexity comes from seeing a private tribunal constituted to decide an investment dispute taking a position of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as a redress measure for past wrongs in a transitional justice process. The arbitration in this case laid bare a procedural dilemma which these tribunals increasingly face. And that is whether and how to address the background of historical inequality. What does the tribunal do? Should a tribunal engage with historical context when there's no obvious legitimacy or procedural tools to take a stand on these bigger political issues? Or does the tribunal remove this wider context from the framing of the dispute? And that, of course, is the approach that is now naturally taken. 
you strip away the background and you end up, I'm afraid, with something which then is dislocated from its essential genesis and context. One commentator said, the tribunal's very intervention is at best unsuitable to partake in the transitional justice process, but it may become a major intrusion in a difficult political balancing act. So there was a difficult balancing act, which is a political balancing act, and the tribunal's involvement actually in the end was an intrusion in that. Once again, it's the process which is causing a problem. Foresti and South Africa, the same issue. This was a claim by Italian investors against the state of South Africa, claiming that South Africans, the South Africa black economic empowerment policy, which was there to correct historical wrongs, was in breach of a treaty. Now that case settled, but the very fact of the claim being brought fueled the arbitral aftermath in South Africa, which led to the move to terminate all their bilateral investment treaties. My examples will carry on, could carry on. In fact, they won't because I have to finish at some point. I want to give one more though, Tetian and Pakistan. Tetian and Pakistan uh, was a claim involving an Australian mining company called Tetian that from 2006 to 2011 invested heavily in mineral exploration in Rekodik. Rekodik is an area of the province of Balochistan in Pakistan with a gold and copper reservoir estimated to hold more than 5.9 billion tons of ore. When the government of Balochistan declined Tetian's mining lease application, Tetian brought an exit arbitration against Pakistan. It also brought an ICC claim against Pakistan. This was a dispute, looks like it was just a mining dispute in Balochistan, but it was a dispute that arose against a very specific local historical and political context. And that context was as follows, a long-term struggle with regard to Balochistan's own interests and governance within the Pakistan federal state. There is a major issue as to how Balochistan is integrated into the federal state of Pakistan, who has responsibility for its governance, who has responsibility for its natural resources. And that was the backdrop to this dispute. The Baloch people are a unique ethno-linguistic group spread between Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And this has been a sore point in the history of Pakistan since 1947. The Rekodik project, when it began, led to huge unrest and opposition from the Baloch people. There were a mass of petitions that were filed um, in the Pakistan courts, challenging the actual mining project. And by the time of the investor state case, around about 2012, there were no less than eight civil, criminal, and human rights petitions pending before the Pakistan Supreme Court. And loads of those, a lot of those, were raising issues from the indigenous people of Balochistan. Now, when the treaty dispute came, it trumped all of that. None of that's relevant in a treaty dispute. So even though those cases had been bubbling away before the Pakistan courts, uh, the, the dispute then became a much narrower dispute under the treaty between investor and state. And the result of that was an award against Pakistan, uh, which, uh, which had nothing to do with the Baloch people, nothing to do with their interests, had no input from them. Pakistan was held liable to pay damages of 5.9 billion US dollars. 5.9 billion. When you add the damages from the ICC parallel case, it was a claim against Pakistan for 11 billion US dollars. That was equivalent to the entirety of Pakistan's 2019 IMF loans. That was 10% of Pakistan's annual budget for a project that never proceeded beyond the planning stage. Pakistan said that immediate enforcement would cause devastating effects to its fragile economy. The case settled, the process, the arbitration process has come and it's gone. But is the case over? No, it isn't. When it settled, 
most of the, the Balochistan political parties stood away from the settlement because to them the whole process still had not engaged them. And what's left behind is a terrible series of scars, of inflammation. And I can tell you this from, word, from, from being on the ground in Pakistan. It is customary if you get into a London black taxi to hear about the weather, to hear about the latest football scores, or to hear alarmingly right-wing perspectives on immigration. <laughs> That's customary. It is customary if you get into a rickshaw in Lahore to hear about the Tetian case, honestly. You, there, the information is not complete and accurate by any means, but it is of national interest. It is considered as a national injury. The number of times I have been in the back of a rickshaw in Lahore mm -hmm. and heard uh, about everything that was wrong with the Tetian case. That is an inflammation caused by the process. It may not be well informed, but it's important. It's dangerous. And it's dangerous because in a similarly ill-informed way, it feeds into an increasing distrust of public international law generally and disaffection and feeling of a lack of enfranchisement or engagement in that process. It also led to Imran Khan when he was in power to propose the termination of all of Pakistan's treaties, bilateral investment treaties. It also led to the caretaker PDM government promulgating what's called a special investment facilitation council, uh, which has been in, uh, in the, there since June 2023, which now involves the Pakistan army in all decisions on foreign international uh, investment. That's the, the level of inflammation. But this will all get much worse. It will get much worse because the risk of arbitral inflammation and scarring is now rising. And that's because the coverage of ISDS is spreading. There is a category of case, perhaps what was contemplated at the outset of this field, which is not very controversial. Good old fashioned forms of investment like construction projects, infrastructure projects, and good old fashioned forms of state interference like direct expropriation or a clear denial of justice. Those were the good old days. But since then, we've had a massive expansion. We don't just deal in those kinds of easy, safe cases. The field, no, the fodder has now completely changed. And that's because we, are, we have developed in its short life in investor state arbitration, a massive expansion on what we say it covers in terms of the definition of investment. We now cover a massive range of sovereign acts, whether they are judicial, executive or legislative. And we also have an expanded view of many treaty guarantees. We now talk about creeping expropriation. We can now talk about any form of sovereign discretion if it causes injury to a foreign investor as a creeping expropriation or a form of a denial of FET or perhaps breach of a legitimate expectation. This is now an area of coverage that actually goes well beyond the scope of what was before the key method of dispute resolution, diplomatic protection. These are forms of disputes that were not included in diplomatic protection traditionally. And now we are dealing with cases such as climate change. We have investor state tribunals ruling on climate change policy. We have measures to address the effects of war, health policy, economic policy, reactions to states of emergency and dislocation. Investor state arbitration is a barometer now of world events. And the crucial point here is that this is pushing tribunals into ever more sensitive areas of sovereign discretion. And therefore the issues themselves are becoming much more political. And they're issues that now don't involve just the immediate parties. If it's climate change, it might affect the whole region, possibly a whole nation, possibly the whole world. Tribunals are now at the center of something where inflammation and scarring is more likely. So let's just step back and consider 
what has happened here. Why is it that we have got this phenomena of arbitral scarring and inflammation? And to answer that, one actually has to start at the beginning and think about why we've got this process in the first place. And that takes us to the extraordinary proposition that this process was designed originally. One of its initial drivers was to depoliticize the resolution of these kinds of disputes. My, my punchline now is, is blindingly obvious, but I've still got some way to go before I deliver it. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary on the definition of depoliticize, it tells you that the first usage was actually quite recent, about 1960. What's interesting is that that coincides with the first usage of depoliticize in investor state disputes, because where it came from was ICSIT. ICSIT started in the 60s, and it started by declaring that it was putting forward a process to depoliticize international disputes. And one can track the development of this. It starts with ICSIT. It starts with Aaron Brockers, one of the architects of ICSIT, who in 1963 said that ICSIT arbitration could remove investment disputes from the intergovernmental political sphere. On the 27th of April, 1964, he made a statement in a chairman's opening address as follows. He said, this is a means of settling disputes on the legal plane. Investment disputes between the state and foreign investor, which would insulate such disputes from the realm of politics and diplomacy. That, the crux of that, was to shift the resolution of disputes away from the politics of diplomatic protection to move it to an objective rule-based system. So the concept which drove all of this was to increase formalization, judicialization, and proceduralization of these disputes, and thereby replace what was a political process with an objective, neutral, legal process. And that has been described in various ways. Shihata, who was then one of the key people in, in developing this whole area at the World Bank, uh, was very strong on the concept of depoliticization. His focus was a little bit different from Broca's. If you look at his writings and his statements at the time, Shihata focused on the role uh, for investor state arbitration to protect host states from the abuses of diplomatic, diplomatic protection from home states. This theme runs all through ICSID. I don't have time to go through all the references, but if you look at the annual reports of ICSID, you will find these references to depoliticization repeatedly up to the current day. Now, this was then taken up by states. When states were negotiating treaties, they themselves championed the idea of depoliticization, of moving from a politics-based system to a rule based system, an objective system. It's interesting, some studies show that not all states were convinced by this originally. Lauger Poulsen uh, has argued that German officials, remember Germany, Pakistan was the first bilateral investment treaty, 1959. Poulsen argues that German officials <coughs> declined to provide for investor state arbitration in Germany, first of all, because of a concern that arbitration could turn every case of expropriation into an international litigation with political relevance. How prescient was that? But that was a minority view. The overall view was actually that this was a process to remove politics. If you look at the US negotiators, they've written more than many others. For example, Van der Velde, who served as attorney advisor to the United States Department of State from 1982 to 1988, wrote that the policy of the BITs at the inception of the US program was to depoliticize investment disputes by channeling them into a legal disputes mechanism created by the BIT itself. One can see this in state practice, where it then develops from there, because I'm now editing as I go along to make sure that you can all leave the room at some point this evening. Where it led from there, from a lot of state practice, was to a mushrooming of arbitration scholarship and articles written 
probing what we really mean by depoliticization. And for your benefit, I am now going to reduce a library of information on this to three propositions. And they are as follows. Firstly, depoliticization means the removal of political discretion of a home state to take up an issue by way of diplomatic protection. That's the narrowest form of depoliticization. You remove that discretion from a home state to elevate this into a political issue. Secondly, perhaps more interestingly, depoliticization impacts the appraisal of the dispute itself. So the arbitration process uses legal rules as opposed to political arbitrary assessments in order to actually appraise the position of the parties. This is all about objective legal criteria. Poon has explained this as follows. Legalization is understood to be con uh, conducive to peace by providing a civilized framework for apolitical dispute resolution, one that is beyond the unilateral influence of any one state and one that does not simply reproduce the unequal power relations between disputing parties. And then thirdly, depoliticization has, has been defined as the process that may de-escalate the broader political fallout that would otherwise be associated with a dispute. Um, and that has been explained by one commentator as follows. It does this by compartmentalizing potentially daunting conflicts between states into individual disputes between investors and states. So if you take a big dispute that could blow up into something nasty and you compartmentalize it into an individual small dispute between investor and state, then you take some of the tension away from it. Now, all of this depoliticization, of course, has a rule of law significance. Rule of law has an international element and a domestic element. The international investor state process is part of that whole mechanism because so many disputes are resolved within it. And therefore it is a component of international rule of law and in turn domestic rule of law itself. I.e., if something goes wrong with this process, it has an impact on rule of law generally. Now, let's take stock. How do we put this all together? What are the real realities about depoliticization? It is manifest now that these goals have not been achieved, at least not achieved in every case. And it's manifest that the risk now is that they will be increasingly thwarted as this process develops. And there are two problems, a problem of theory and a problem of practice. So firstly, theory. In the old fashioned, nice, containable investor dispute of a construction project and good old fashioned direct expropriation, this is fine. But if you move away from that comfortable field into the new world of disputes involving climate change, involving nuclear power, involving war, then this doesn't make sense anymore. And the reason is because these are essentially political issues. You cannot sensibly, credibly approach this pretending that they're technical. There's a technical element, but they exist in an essential socio-economic political context. And it's that context that explains the dispute. And so compartmentalizing at that moment isn't actually removing politics. What it's doing is removing reality. That means that tribunals are being themselves placed in the middle of a political storm. What are they to do in that position? Take Vattenfall and Germany, famous case under the Energy Charter Treaty, arising out of Germany's decision to phase out nuclear power. Professor Stefan Schill wrote this about the Vattenfall, the Vattenfall dispute. He said, this dispute touches on an issue that has marked Germany's social and political culture over the past three and a half decades like no other issue apart from German reunification. He said, Vattenfall II, which is one of the cases, is seen as a challenge to a fundamental social and political settlement and hence to democracy more generally. 
You can't approach that kind of dispute and say you are applying simply objective technical norms. That simply doesn't... So as a matter of theory, we are laboring under a fallacy if we say that this is about depoliticization because it patently can't be. That's theory. What about practice? Well, practice I've already spoken about. Practice is Tetian and Pakistan. Practice is Pezold and Zimbabwe. Or it's Copper Mesa and Ecuador. If the goal of depoliticization is peaceful, objective, unpoliticized dispute resolution, we don't have it. We have scarring and we have inflammation. Actually, if the goal is even removing disputes from the state state level, we also don't have it. Because studies have been published to show that even when there is investor state arbitration on foot, states are still getting involved. There is a very, uh, one example of course is Chevron Ecuador. Chevron Ecuador was a dispute that actually prompted state to state proceedings, as well as a whole wealth of other proceedings arising out of an investor state case. Lauga Polson has also done research on the extent to which states will still intervene themselves like they would have done in, in the old fashioned diplomatic protection days. And in a 2016 study, he found that there, for the US, for example, the availability of investors, uh, investor treaty arbitration to US investors had no significant effect on whether or the extent to which the US government would raise the issue at the intergovernmental level. So we're not doing very well there either. In terms of the overall scarring and inflammation, we must add in to our story concrete manifestations of distrust. We now have an exodus by states away from investor state treaties. That is undeniable. Uh, according to UNCTAD, to date there have been 512 terminations of investment treaties. That number is increasing exponentially. There are now more terminations than new treaties per year. We can add into that uh, the, the fact that we now have new reports on non-compliance with investor state awards. In October 2023, very recently, there was a second edition of the report on compliance with investor treaty arbitration published, showing alarming numbers of non-compliance by states who were, are surprising, including EU states in particular, not to mention anyone in particular, Spain. <laughs> And now, two weeks ago, we have the most devastating UN report on climate change, which was presented to the General Assembly. Um, it is a controversial report uh, done by Special Rapporteur David Boyd, and it's entitled, rather neutrally, Paying Polluters. The Catastrophic Consequences of Investor State Dispute Settlement for Climate and Environment Action and Human Rights. Where the core problem is, is as follows. We have imposed on investor state arbitration a commercial arbitration Anglo-US adversarial process and with it an adversarial commercial arbitration mindset. You will know the nature of investor state arbitration and commercial arbitration completely different completely different. Contractual commercial arbitration involves parties, even a state, in a horizontal relationship. They have agreed a contract which encapsulates their mutual rights and obligations, and they are therefore, in that sense, at the same level. And whatever's resolved between them is just between them. Investor state arbitration is not horizontal, it is vertical. It's like administrative law or public law. It is one entity, investor, challenging the exercise of sovereign discretion, which may affect everybody. Therefore, in nature, it is totally different. But we are squeezing it into the commercial arbitration model. And if you do that, there are three adverse consequences. There could be four, but it's now late in the evening. <laughs> so here are three. Firstly, immediately you have a lack of access of all stakeholders. Naturally, because in commercial arbitration, you're not interested in anybody else apart from the parties who have contracted. And that's not only in process, it's in mindset. And therefore, other stakeholders will not have an involvement. Yes, we have an amici process. 
Yes, we have an intervener's process. Frankly, they're not taken very seriously. Why? Because partly many amici are not amici. They are NGOs with agendas. Uh, and secondly, because there's a concern about expanding the scope of the dispute, about imposing an unfair burden of costs on one party, normally the investor, about the fact that actually in commercial arbitration we don't have third party interventions. So we give limited indulgence. We allow them to come in on a limited basis. Very rarely do they get full access to the full written record. This doesn't actually help this process. Just to go back to the two week ago UN report given to the General Assembly on climate change, which is withering and devastating if you read it. One particular criticism, criticism is this. The UN Special Rapporteur looked at cases like Eco Oro and Colombia and Von Pezold in Zimbabwe. And he says in terms, please read paragraphs 24 and 25 of this report. He says, public participation and access to justice with effective remedies are fundamental rights in and of themselves, but they're also integral to the full enjoyment of human rights. Inclusive public participation improves the quality of decision making enhances rights holder support for projects and fulfills human rights obligations. But we don't cater for it because we haven't got that model. We've got an investor state, uh, we, sorry, we've got a commercial arbitration model. That's the first one. The second one is this, the problem of arbitral tunnel vision. Arbitral tunnel vision. If you use the commercial arbitration procedure, you are placing the tribunal in the elevated position of a neutral umpire waiting to be educated by the parties appearing before them. It is adversarial. It's what F.A. Mann famously called the principle of unpreparedness. He waits or she waits to be educated. And if they're not educated, then it's not on their record and it's not part of the decision. Now, that has major problems with it. Firstly, the tribunal doesn't get the full picture unless they're given the full picture. End of story. Next problem. People don't aim to educate the tribunal. If you're counsel, that's not your task. Actually, it should be. Your task, rather than educating the tribunal, is to win. And by winning, you don't necessarily educate. You provide the information, of course, it's got to be honest and truthful, that you need to win. That has in it all sorts of limitations. The investor is unlikely to be going out and asking stakeholders in any event what their view is. Will the state? Well, the state should, but that's not an answer. We know that, practically speaking. Yes, the state should be the one who will give voice to the people in Ecuador, but the state doesn't. Because the state has budget limitations, because the state is dysfunctional, because it has political issues, because it has no institutional memory, because it doesn't have the wherewithal to do it. And worse than this, there is strategy involved. The strategy is that you don't always put the best witnesses forward. You put forward the witnesses who will perform best, who will be best for cross-examination, who can string a sentence together. That isn't always the best person to testify, but that's not your interest. We have a recent and alarming example of the limitations of the adversarial process, and that is the Nigeria case. The recent well-known case of Federal Republic of Nigeria and PNID, 23rd of October, Justice Knowles in the Commercial Court in London sets aside an award which with interest was for $11 billion. An award rendered by the most experienced tribunal chaired by none other than Lord Hoffman. And it was set aside because Justice Knowles said the arbitration was a shell that got nowhere near the truth. Why? because there was corruption. That corruption was never brought before the tribunal. So the tribunal proceeded and rendered the award. Actually, it was an award against what Lord Hoffman later described as a miasma of corruption. My point isn't about corruption. It's about the limitation of this process. That's an example where the highest level tribunal doesn't have the full picture. And it's the same limitation which causes the scarring and inflammation if a tribunal is ruling on these highly political disputes without the benefit of all the information. Here's the third problem. The third problem of using the commercial arbitration procedural model is polarization. When you have the commercial arbitration model, you arrange the parties in interest groups, claimant, respondent, 
And what naturally happens is polarization. Each side starts to get more and more extreme in the position that they're putting forward. You're not going to argue if you're the state. Well, you know, it's right. It could be right or wrong. There are a number of possibilities. This was a difficult issue. You are going to argue through your highly polarized council. We were right. That's it. It's black and white in an adversarial system. It's not gray. But here's the problem. Policy is gray. It's not black and white. If I'm an arbitrator deciding a climate change policy, it's not a question of yes or no. It's a highly nuanced issue. If I'm a government official deciding climate policy, that is a complex, delicate, nuanced process. But as an arbitrator, you're not doing that. As an arbitrator, there's a fundamental mismatch because the middle ground where policy is made is not addressed. You're hearing the peripheries. And if that middle ground is not addressed, it's not going to feature in your decision making. And therefore, your result will be totally isolated from the policy making process itself. So here we are with the scarring and the inflammation. It's not about the result itself. Of course, that's another lecture. You'll be mercifully, I'm not giving it. But Put that aside, rights and wrongs. It's the process itself which is feeding in to all of these problems. It's the limitations which is causing the scarring. And so here I move into what we do about it. You're looking at watches, there isn't much time left, so here we go. <laughs> what we do about it is something totally counterintuitive. What we don't do is limit ourselves to the current reform debate. Because the current reform debate, with all due respect to everybody, especially those participating in Unsertral Working Group 3 at the moment, that reform debate is about improving the arbitration system. It's about making it more efficient, more consistent, transparent. But the problems go far, far further than that box. This is a problem about depoliticization. Depoliticization is causing a problem. And what I'm going to say is counterintuitive. We actually need to think about injecting politics back in. We need to think about re-politicizing. And by that, I mean allowing disputes to be resolved against their natural habitat, in their natural habitat. That means taking into account their natural context. That means if you are deciding von Pezold in Zimbabwe, you are allowing yourself to hear from indigenous people. You are understanding what the political dynamic is that led to the government decision to say they couldn't stop it. That means that if you are deciding Tetian and Pakistan, you are aware of, you are informed by, uh, informed about the Balochistan issues, the, the actual struggle that was happening at the time. Why? Because when you then make your resolution, when you dis make your award, you are rendering something that is most likely to actually have legitimacy and acceptance. What you're not then doing is walking into the inevitable condemnation, which is what we have at the moment, from all those stakeholders and interests that didn't have their day in court. This is now to remove the fiction of rule-based against policy-based, because the task at hand is essentially political. There have been people who, many people who have written about this, and I want to refer just to one in particular, and that is Tamar Meschel. Uh, writing in 2019 about the original nature of, as it happens, state-to-state -state arbitration. Meschel wrote that modern international arbitration has lost sight and the benefit of its mixed politico-legal origins. He said that the legal dimension of interstate arbitration allows state parties to submit legal questions to an arbitral tribunal and to present arguments grounded in law. But the political dimension of interstate arbitration allows states parties to submit politically sensitive questions to an arbitral tribunal and to advance extra legal arguments based on political, historical and economical considerations or local and traditional customs. So what he's referring back to is, is a form of interstate arbitration, which actually we've lost sight of nowadays because we're so focused on a contemporary, judicialized form of the process. Everybody in the room is now hating what I'm saying. 
And it's understandable because this cuts against everything that we think about when we talk about principal dispute resolution. But what we've got to face is that our current process simply isn't working. It's true it works in a category of case, but there's this expanding sister category which we are, is going to carry on. It's going to carry on expanding where it's not working. What is the point of our process? If we come, we decide the dispute and we go. And all that we've done is we've left inflammation and we've left scarring. And so the procedural proposal is to rethink what we do, both in terms of the commercial arbitration adversarial model, which needs to be different. It needs to be more inquisitorial. It needs to be something possibly completely different, in some cases like commissions of inquiry, where you actually have a tribunal that is determining something but deciding who it hears from and how it hears it and what that, how that all comes together, how it's to be resolved in order to enfranchise the very people who otherwise are going to condemn the process as they are driving their rickshaw in Lahore. There are ways of doing that, but it's beyond the scope of working group three. This is not a rant about the end of ISDS. It's not a lecture about the end of investor protection. This is a call for a fundamental rethink of our current adversarial system so that investor state dispute resolution can come and go and leave winners and losers who all equally feel they have been part of that dispute resolution process. High up in the majestic mountains of Ecuador, on the lush green slopes of the Intag Valley, whether or not Copper Mesa had been compensated, the local communities should be able to explain the process that has taken, part, taken place. And they should understand who has ruled upon their lives. Frankly, other than the reluctance to look at our field afresh, there is nothing stopping us achieving this. Thank you very much. What a tort in force. Uh, that was just one of the most extraordinary uh, lectures I've heard. One of the most extraordinary Alexander lectures so thought-provoking in the current uh, regime, in the world that we live in today, Toby, and uh, I can only thank you. My first point is that the Tetian case, uh, when I was in Lahore, I not only heard about that, but also the cricket stores from the <laughs> test match. So, you know, they're not much different to our taxi drivers Agreed. here. Agreed. And I suspect that the taxi drivers here are talking about commissions of inquiry. It might be the Grenfell inquiry, it might be the post office inquiry, but it's a similar sort of thing. It's involvement of those who are scarred and who are victimed, victims of this process that you so eloquently identified. My own experience, if I may go so far, it does involve a case that you were in, uh, and this was the Bywater case against Tanzania involving the uh, sewage and water system of Dar es Salaam and my recollection is that that was probably one of the first cases where amicus briefs were introduced into the process and my strong recollection is that they were given pretty short shrift yes and you were sat on that tribunal I and I, I think you possibly were one of them <laughs> who gave them pretty yeah. because everyone said yeah. Well, what's this got to do with the issues between the parties? So the amicus brief yeah. Yeah. is not. So, so that, that is a very significant case uh, for me because I was arbitrator, one of the arbitrators on it. Bywater Tanzania, as you say, was one of the first instances under the ICSIT rules which focused upon when an amicus or intervener would be allowed in. We had four, from memory, four interventions requested or we had maybe more, but we allowed for. 
that was a huge, it was under protest from everybody. What were these people doing coming into the dispute? As it happened, they were a mixture of NGOs uh, who had issues about privatization and water issues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, water policy. So Bywater Tanzania is a classic, classic uh, uh, configuration in terms of its case of a foreign investor coming in actually under a World Bank sponsored policy for water pri privatization. Uh, the, the performance was highly questionable. Tanzania wanted to stop it. Uh, they did the, one of the textbook errors. If you're a state, don't, don't do this. If you want to expropriate, they sent in the army. <laughs> Top tip, you can expropriate, but don't use the army. So they sent in the army and, uh, and Bywater were chucked out. An investor state claim is brought. And, and that comes before us as a tribunal, as a dispute between the, the investor company and, and, and the state. Then we have interventions, and the interventions were all about the nature of this policy of, of uh, privatization of water. Huge opposition, and at the time, it was early days, um, it was felt, well, we'll give them a limited involvement, but they can't see everything because that would start to expand the process too much. So they only had a limited glimpse of some of the documents, not all the documentary record. They, they, they were not allowed to make arguments in front of us, and they made short written submissions. We make our award. What happened after that award was published was a lot of criticism of us, of the award. Actually, what, what we found was that there had been a breach of the treaty, but we found there had been no, no loss. No. So we didn't actually award any damages. But still, people wrote saying what we had done was divorced from reality. And the key point was, we never considered the views of 350,000 water users in Dar es Salaam. And it was them it was their lives, it was their daily water that was impacted. Mm. And I have to say that, that, that has stayed with me, as you may tell, you can tell, <laughs> uh, it's stayed with me ever since. Yes, and it stayed with me as well, because uh, you know, I was involved in the background on behalf of government, uh, the British government, who had an interest in the yes. outcome uh, under an overseas investment uh, uh, policy of insurance. And again, uh, being a commercial sort of litigator or arbitrator, uh, this idea of an amicus brief from NGOs was totally alien. Yeah. And, you know, we're so used to our pleading process, narrowed down, these are the issues, and let's get on with the, pro let's get on with the award yes. on the issues before us. Exactly. It. And what we're now, as you rightly point out, is seeing is that we're making these decisions in a highly, uh, a much more complicated socio-economic, political dimension exactly and, exactly uh, i mean this is you know climate change human rights water rights and everything like this so you now advocate <laughs> this change of process mm. which may come as an anathema to many in the audience who mm. you know make their daily bread about it and you come up with this idea of a commission how do we ensure a commission maintains this all-important facet that we're all used to of due process? Yes, yes. We've heard the criticisms in the Grenfell case, for example. How do we ensure that people are properly heard in a process like that? Yeah. So I, it's a very, very important issue, obviously. But where one has to start on this is what do we mean by due process mm. or natural justice? In our world of arbitration, which is commercial arbitration in terms of the process, we have come to an understanding of due process and natural justice, which is infected by the adversarial process. So we understand it as the right to put your case and to respond to the case that is put against you. That is defined, calibrated, measured, and assessed by court. Mm. So obviously in arbitration law, we have it in yeah. section 33 of the English Arbitration Act, you have it in model law, and then we have a wealth of jurisprudence on that. But the point about due process and natural justice is yes, everybody has got to have a right to have a hearing, aldi alter and partem, and all, all our canons that we use. None of that tells you it must be an adversarial process, actually. We understand it through the lens of adverse, mm -hmm. adversarial process because that's what, we, what we've always done. 
but there are non-adversarial systems around the world that also apply natural justice and due process. And so what will be required in my magical world, which I am commending to you, is that judges will have to recalibrate and reassess what constitutes due process and natural justice in a process that's not essentially adversarial. And yes, there will have to be that guarantee. There is nothing, as far as I can see, to prevent that happening. Why, why, can't, why can't there be an understanding developed of what it means to have a full hearing and to have an opportunity of answering all the points that are being put against you in the context of something that looks different to an adversarial process? Mm. And the selection of those in charge of the, tri of yeah. the committee of the inquiry. Commission, yeah. I mean, from a personal point of view, or from having dis uh, discussed these issues with claimants and, of course, respondents, sometimes one questions who the tribunal yeah. are really yeah. accountable to. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a process, <laughs> but uh, you know, very intelligent people like your good self and many other well-experienced people in the arbitration world, but what, you know, are you there to be educated about yeah. human rights? Yeah. Are, are you, have you been in some way elected yes. by those yes. who are, whose issues, whose, whose circumstances are being affected? So, th so this, this point was, was, was really the crux of the criticism on the Zimbabwe case. Right. In the Zimbabwe case that I spoke about, von Pezold in Zimbabwe, the critics were saying, look, the task that you as a tribunal are doing is whether you, whether you like it or not, you are ruling upon a very delicate bit of Zimbabwe history mm -hmm. uh, to do with correcting wrongs, historical wrongs, in a transitional process. So what's your legitimacy to do that? That's what they were saying. How can you do it? That's partly who are you? Who are you accountable to? It's also what tools do you have available to do that? Because that's something which actually is an incredibly complex process, a complex thing to do. So, so the individuals can be, they can be ex, you know, expert and they can be experienced, but they've got to have legitimacy and they've got to have the correct tools. Mm -hmm. Now in my, in my magical world, they, they, they are people who can be anybody, but they're placed in a position where they are allowed to actually become legitimate because they are taking the lead to ensure that all the voices are heard and that all the interests are considered. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very different exercise to standing back and waiting for arguments from counsel. And so this requires a complete change in framework. Where do you think the impetus for generating a new framework might come? Uh, we know that UNCTAD 3 is looking at improving the system. Is it UNCTAD or it's, so <laughs> is it some other institution? <laughs> so, is it so, the World Bank, for example? Yeah. Tell, you know, where, where are we going to start in terms of finding a champion for this proposition that you have so eloquently put forward? So I think there, there, are, there are two ways in which this might happen. One is more realistic than the other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, start with a more realistic one. Mm. The more realistic one is we don't change anything in terms of law. We change nothing. We have treaties already which have arbitration provisions in them, thousands of them, and we live with them, and we will live with them, whether we like it or not, for years. Uh, we've got uh, arbitration laws and we have arbitration rules, but the point that everybody misses, notwithstanding my repeated ranting on this, is that none of that structure that I've just mentioned dictates an adversarial process. It doesn't. It dictates natural justice and due process. It doesn't say you must follow a strictly adversarial process. It allows tribunals to take the initiative, to ask questions, to make inquiries. It allows them to hear from other entities, to call witnesses themselves. But these are the funny bits of the rules that nobody ever wants to use. Tribunals don't want to do it. The mindset is against it. Look at section 34 of the English Arbitration Act 1996. It says in one of the subsections, will the tribunal take the initiative in finding fact or law? That was put in in 1996 to try and encourage people to think differently from just an adversarial process. It was a failure, but it's there. 
And, and there's nothing in the UNCTRA rules, in the ICSIT rules, there's nothing saying that tribunals can't do this. They can. So now, without changing anything, we can actually make our existing process less adversarial and more inclusive. But the big problem is mindset. That's the big one. The big one is to get arbitrators and lawyers and parties on board to do it. That's the more realistic route. The second route is outside of all of this, which is the true commission of inquiry, which is starting with a blank page and actually creating something uh, which, is, uh, uh, which states may want to adopt and, and, and arbitrators or whoever, or commissioners or whatever we call them, might want to embrace. I don't have a magic answer apart from, apart from talking about it and encouraging people and thinking that there should be a, an overall consensus that we need something different. Well, it's like all these things, you've got to get the conversation yeah. going. Yeah. And that's very important. Yeah. I'd like to turn to the audience now, and uh, we have a roving microphone, <coughs> and see if anybody would like to raise a question of Toby on this very interesting topic. Anybody got any points or questions? Yes, uh, well, we've... gentlemen there. <coughs> Hello, uh, thank you very much for the... Could you stand and tell us your name and where you're from? Right, my name is Samuel Kuo and I've just done the membership course I'm in between <coughs> careers. Uh, thank you very much for the speech. I just thought I would, if you could dilate on the fact that you talked about the, actually, instead of depoliticizing, we need to bring politics back into it. That's, I suppose it's one of the issues. Yes. Then how would you ensure uh, 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 commission, as it were, that is neutral and unbiased. At the same time, having the grasp of, say, I don't know, in Pakistan or in Zimbabwe, yeah. of the history of the issues, would that just naturally strip away ADR in some ways? Just going, so, would it strip away? Uh, strip away the, the, the structure of ADR and simply going back to domestic courts or simply have a domestic arbitration, then I suppose that would be resolved. No, I, I don't see that it needs to change very much other than make the, the decision makers better informed. And I can just give a specific example. I think the Zimbabwe example is one of the most compelling actually, uh, but it's not the, by no means is it the only one. If the Zimbabwe argument was, which it was to the tribunal, we have a particular issue, which means we cannot stop our indigenous population from invading white farms, white, 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 white owned farms. And that problem is a historical one, and it's an economic one, and it's a political one. And that, if that's their case, which it was, then that needs to be explained. But the tribunal had limited patience for it, frankly, because they felt that these were broader, difficult, contextual issues which were not actually going to inform the precise decision they had to take under the terms of the treaty. So that's, to me, is the clearest example. Yes, by all means, decide under the treaty. By all means, you have to do that. That's your mandate. But you're deciding something which exists in a necessary political context. And therefore, how can you do that by consciously stripping away that context? You can do it. They did it. But you walk into the criticism afterwards that this is disconnected with reality. Sir. Ah. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you very much for the very wonderful uh, views that you have, you have shared. I want to make a comment and then I'll ask a question. It's, it's on. Yeah. It's Would on. you like to just tell us who you are? And My name is Chikwendo Madumere from Nigeria, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful insights you've shared with us this evening. I want to make a comment and then I'll ask a question. Uh, talking about the process with regards to ISDS, I, I, I have a recollection that in the case of Metanex and, and the US, conducted uh, under NAFTA using the 1978 uh, Ancestral Rules, the tribunal bent backwards, you know, under Article 17 of the Ancestral Rules and said yes, because the rule allows us to conduct the arbitration in a way that we deem necessary, yeah. that they were going to allow amicu submissions, and they did. That is one. Then number two, is there a possibility that the textual context of, of treaties entered into by states, you know, may be the reason why some tribunals find it very difficult, you know, to allow for third-party participation? 
Because I ask this question, keeping in mind that the modern treaties, you know, framed by states, anticipates third party participation and also anticipates, you know, recognition of uh, regulatory powers of host states. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I essentially agree with, with, with everything you said. <laughs> um, it's right. But, but the, the, the thing is that a lot of treaties themselves are not very normative on this. They will just set out guarantees and they'll set out all the other provisions. They're not actually directing a tribunal very much as to how to implement them. That's one of the problems in this field, actually. It just leads me, I, I'm sorry if this is not completely related, but I think, I think it is. One of the problems is we say traditionally it's been said, and these were the references I gave, that the field was designed to take away disputes from politics into a rule-based environment. Now the problem is, look at the nature of that rule-based environment. It's not anything like a rule-based environment that we would understand in domestic law. These are broadly framed principles in treaties they're very broadly framed without much guidance. FET is not defined. What does FET mean? Well, we know the whole story of this. But if you're an arbitrator, I can tell you the experience of being an arbitrator in these cases, you do not have clear guidance. You don't have clear guidance in the text. You don't have clear guidance in jurisprudence because there's no doctrine of precedent. And therefore, yes, you can look at previous decisions, but everything technically is up for grabs. Treaties are broadly framed because that's the lowest common denominator that can be agreed between contracting states. That's why they're not that detailed. And, and you know, the, the famous definition of a treaty, which is, which is a disagreement set out in writing. <laughs> so, so, and so, entered into for a photo opportunity. And, and entered, exactly. Yes. So everybody, you know, you sign the treaty, you've got a wonderful moment with a table with flowers, everybody's shaking hands, it's a moment of love and harmony, and it's a photo moment. And everybody leaves the room thinking the treaty means something different. And then the poor tribunal has got to pick up the pieces. But that is critical in these areas, because if we go back to where I started on this, all right, you're moving apparently from politics-based to rule-based, except that you're not given many rules in what are essentially political issues. That's the problem. Interesting. I'll come back to the room in a minute, if I may. Uh, Mercy, have we got any questions from our audience uh, online? We have to be inclusive in this. Yeah, one of one common one of which I will note is whether or not, since you were so cruelly forced to fit this into one hour, you will write a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer is the day after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a question from Sarita Woolhouse. The process of ISDS was and continues to be a search for a one-size-fits-all solution. To what extent is this a root of the problem? BITs have become standardized, and so, have, so has the process. Um, these are for long terms with no flexibility. Completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, it's become standardized. But what's, what's curious also, and I'm afraid this is probably another, another lecture for another day, but what's, if you go back to look at where this actually started, all right, why do we have investor state arbitration any, uh, in the first place? The, 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 the misconception on this is that it was led by users, investors, or states. It wasn't. If you want to look at a brilliant book on this, you have to look at Taylor, Taylor St. John's book on the origins of this area. Where it came from was the World Bank. It started as an idea by the architects of Exit. Mm. It wasn't because investors were asking for it. Of course, in, when they had it, they liked it, but, uh, uh, but they didn't ever say they needed it. In fact, what people wanted at the time, but it couldn't be agreed, was an international insurance system. Or if they couldn't be an international multilateral insurance system, then a substantive system of substantive protections rather than just process. So I'm saying this because led by World Bank civil servants, we ended up with the UNSA trial model. Not because that was a reflection of what the market needed or wanted. It was the promotion of an onset trial model uh, and an exit model, which is, as Sarita is saying, a one size fits all. And as I've tried to explain, I think it's the wrong size. And what we have, of course, is the export credit agencies, yes. which started out in the 20s. Yes. Then it developed into the idea of MEGA and OPIC yes. being 
you know, in, in international exactly. multilateral insurance uh, uh, facilities, which have had sort of variable um, uh, uh, results, yes. I think, in, overall. Um, so can I just go back to the room before we go yep. online? There's a gentleman there. You put you, the gentleman sat next to you, I'm afraid, was yep. the first up. And then after you have... <coughs> Sure, I need the microphone. I think you answered the, the question, my question, which was, am I right in assuming that there is room for your magical word under the exi existing treaty yes. frameworks? Yes, yes, right. absolutely. Right. But, but as I say, the biggest impediment is not law or rules, it's mindset. Yeah. Lady there, then, yes, Frederico. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kim Franklin, Crown Office Chambers, uh, international arbitrator of the traditional sort. Um, I, I wonder, Would you like to uh, uh, def define it? <laughs> Toby will define it. <laughs> Thank you for uh, stimulating our thoughts. We, we need uh, to uh, have more of it. Um, I, and I'm going to make a suggestion. It's rather against my uh, livelihood, but... Um, Lawyers are traditionally conservative types. They don't like change. Uh, and you only need to uh, suggest that we introduce some of the initi initiatives of the Green Pledge to see how keen tribunal members are to reduce flying in business class, mm -hmm. uh, to know that change is, is not uh, popular. So uh, is the answer to have fewer lawyers? <gasps> <laughs> or, or at least to have a non-legal chair uh, for uh, the uh, tribunals that you mm. have in mind. Will that take us to your <coughs> magical land? I, 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 th I thank you for the suggestion. I mean, I think, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it, it will be one element in many other elements. And, and I say that not because there's a problem with lawyers, but it comes back to what I keep saying, and I forgive me for repeating it, but it is a mindset yeah. problem. So the mindset is not just arbitrators, it's also lawyers. And the truth, of course, the practical reality for all my, uh, my idealistic vision, the truth is that you turn up at a, the first procedural meeting in an arbitration and everybody already is on the same page. They already have in mind procedural order number one and it has a set system. And for the tribunal, it's quite difficult if the lawyers are saying, well, we've agreed this and this is how we want to do it. Mm -hmm. So it is not just, uh, it's not just an arbitral mindset. It's also lawyers. Everybody has got to start afresh. And, and that's difficult because in our system, if you're a lawyer, your interest is not that. Your interest is to win the case. So that's what you do. So, so I don't have a magic answer, but I, I certainly take your, your suggestion on board. So the day we all turn up and say, actually, can I refer you to section 34 yeah. of the yeah. arbitration? Yeah. Right? yeah, It's going to take you back somewhat, isn't it? You know, it's like it's the same thing about the Prague rules. Yeah. Pe pe the Prague rules have struggled. People don't like it. The Prague rules is a, uh, a sort of continental civil law approach to the IBA rules, essentially. I mean, that's unfair, but that's essentially. So it's much more inquisitorial, much more hands-on, and it's got a wealth of critics. If we can't even handle the Prague rules, then my magical world is far off, I'm afraid. But, but that's what we have to focus on. Frederico. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we... Hi, thanks. Fred Singarato. Um, two questions that came up whilst you were saying. So first, do you think that potentially the mindset, certainly on the arbitrate of the tribunal side, might be we have good knowledge of due process paranoia, might yeah. be a partiality paranoia. Yes. That if you become, begin to ask questions and lead yes. the inquisition, you may be actually advocating for one side as opposed to another, yes. first of all. And that, that there is an impartiality requirement normally in most rules, and so that, that, that might be what they are interpreting. So yes is the answer to that. I just, just to pause, because that's, a, if I may say, a very, very good point. Due process paranoia is one of the biggest impediments to my magical world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Due process paranoia is now, uh, um, it fashions everything we do in this field. And what that means is that tribunals are so scared of challenge <laughs> to themselves or their awards, they will do the least, uh, the least that, they, that, they can, that they need to do. So they will never want to show their hand because of the problem of bias and the problem of an accusation of prejudgment. They will sit there 
and they'll try and keep a straight face even if they're bored out of their minds and think this is completely irrelevant because they have to show neutrality and objectivity, all of this because of the fear of, of change. Now, we have to address due process paranoia. My magical world is, not, is, just, is completely uh, unrealistic unless we do that. Of course, it's a subset of the mindset problem. But to deal with due process paranoia, uh, even without a commission of inquiry, just to get a tribunal to use section 34 and be inquisitorial, we, we actually need the help of judges. This is starting a little bit in some uh, jurisdictions like Singapore. We need some healthy judicial statements saying this isn't going to be the basis of a challenge to give comfort. That is the cure for paranoia, is to know that there is a body of case law that challenges if you want acting inquisitorially are going to fail. It's not a, so that, but I think that's all possible. Because right. the problem with commissions of quiet yeah. here is you've got judicial review. Yes, you yes, know, yes, yes, absolutely. You know, two year yeah, inquiry, and then someone says, okay, it yeah. all went wrong, let's yeah. judicially review yeah. it. And I yeah. mean, that's just. You know. So it's, it has to be a partnership with the whole parts of the dispute resolution ecosystem. Mm. Okay. Jonathan's point just leads to my yeah. second follow up question, Sorry. which is <laughs> if, if you have an inquisitorial commission type inquiry type setup for ISDS. Yeah. They are notoriously famous for overrunning, yes. overcosting, and then being judicially reviewed. Yes. Uh, and in a ISDS scenario where you effectively technically have two parties, who banks that? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Don't have an immediate answer. We can come up with an answer. All of, there are so many issues like that, so many points that would have to be designed. M my sense, however, is that. Of course we can come up with an answer. Of course there's a way of structuring it, but it just requires fresh thinking on this. And, and if you say, you know, the, the other danger is to say, well, you say commission of inquiry, and so people say, well, you mean Grenfell. Maybe you mean Savile. You know, I mean, in, but of course there are, there are many examples you can give, but that's just a really poor way of analyzing it. It's not a question of saying, well, we've got limited options and we'll just cut and paste. Why, why don't we just design something that actually works for what we need? Mercy, online? Um, Paul Mason asks something that I was actually wondering as well. What do you think of the EU Multilateral Investment Court proposal? Does it address your points, or is it just more of the same with judicial robes on? All right, good. Very, very good question. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say I am actually um, uh, um, favorable to that as a proposal. I think that there is scope for a multilateral court, that it may well go some way to um, answering some of the points. It doesn't go far enough for me, but I think a court structure immediately takes away from part of the problem of commercial arbitration, which is the limited view. In a court, uh, normally courts will allow third parties in, in a way that's much, much, you know, interveners or people who are interested parties without this constraint of a bilateral relationship in their, in their, in their head. So, I think that there, it's, there, it's got lots of problems, of course, we know in, in, in its detail, but I think it has potential. But it's not my magical world, actually. It's not, my magical world is more extreme. Lady there, if I may. Thank you. Agnieszka Zarówna, White and Case. So um, in this new brave magical world, uh, once we educate the decision makers, about all those uh, voices that maybe currently are excluded due to the tunnel vision. What then? How are the decision makers to take them into account and reflect them into their decision making? Is there a call for more of an exec one bono, more of a sort of equities approach to decision making? Or how does that all, all of that wealth of education <coughs> will be reflected in the decision making process? Yeah. So part, part of the references that I gave, especially towards the end of the lecture, were in this, uh, looking at this older version of state-state arbitration, where arbitrators were acting not just legally, but also diplomatically. That was one of the last references that I gave. That is more focused on the idea of ex aequo et bono. And that turns a lot of people off immediately. Um, but I don't think it needs to be that, actually. What's more interesting to me, because I'm focused on procedure and not substance at the moment, is that even within the application of our existing standards, that is treaty provisions, that is principles of customary international law, those principles 
demand in many respects, in my view, better information and better knowledge. You can be applying fair and equitable treatment. But to understand fair and equitable treatment, you actually need to be better educated. So I'm not actually advocating a free-for-all ex equo bono world. I, I'm very happy with a principled world. I'm happy with the idea of applying these kinds of principles which have been agreed between the states. But what I want is I want them applied in, them in, in an optimum way and applied in a way that doesn't have scarring and inflammation around them. It makes me think of the law of the sea and um, how that's dealt with quite often. Yes. It's a bit, big, broad, yes. much broader, yes. but environmentally yes. very important yes. and such like. Can I just add, I just want to add, sorry on this, there's a whole debate at the moment about, the, about, for example, the relevance of human rights in investor state arbitration. Just as there's a debate at the moment about the relevance of other public international law norms within investor state arbitration, environmental law, all sorts of other areas. That is an active, incredibly important debate. The problem is, I think, that part of the answer to that, which is a substantive debate, substantive principles, is being infected by the process. Because the procedure is so narrowed down to the rights and obligations of these parties only under this treaty, that people feel if you start looking at human rights, you are bringing in a political element which you shouldn't. That's a confusion of process and substance, actually. But I think that what I'm, what I'm advocating is incredibly important as we start to understand better, as we have to, how human rights works or may, may work within our existing legal framework. We might talk to Jonathan Sumption, who has just written an article in The Spectator about we should lose, leave the... Uh, oh. you see, uh, but we'd expect that sort of thing <laughs> from Jonathan Sumption. And, um, and, and some taxi drivers. And some taxi drivers. <laughs> uh, one more. And, so Hector Casal notes that many new generations of model, model trade treaties address these issues, although most of the ISDS cases currently are arising under the first generation yeah. of BITs. As the disputes under the new generation become more common, will this be addressed naturally? Um, to the extent that some do. Um, but interestingly, some of the new generation BITs are worse. It's, it's interesting. I, was, I didn't have time. I was going to read out. There's a very interesting bit in, 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 in uh, I think it's one of the Italian treaties, new generation treaties, which expressly cautions arbitrators not to pay any attention to political uh, issues or anything outside of the specific issues at stake. It's a kind of a provision that is very interesting provision um, that is warning against um, uh, uh, external clamour somehow affecting the process. So it all depends on what's in the new generation treaty. Um, I, 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 it, they, some, some may well help. I imagine most of them won't go far enough. So, uh, ben Baker, I'm a student member currently studying for the bar. Uh, very simple one just to end with, I suppose. Uh, regarding the rate with which the BITs are being revoked, being fast mm. and they're being made, would you anticipate that with a uh, fresh faith in the arbitral process that they would then be remade because of it or will they sort of end up having to be remade anyway as, as just part of being a, a country that trades internationally? No, so countries at the moment <clears throat> that are terminating their bilateral investment treaties are doing so on the basis that they feel that they don't need these treaties to attract foreign direct investment. Um, and they feel that they are being actively hurt by these treaties. And if I'd had more time, and I had about three pages on it, I would have listed the countries that are doing this because it's extraordinary. It's the countries now that are actively either terminating or talking about terminating their treaties come from north, south, east, west. They come from all uh, economic profiles. It's not just who you imagine. It's it's all sorts of countries now moving away from it. So they're doing so against the backdrop that there is nothing at the moment that's really shown or proven that foreign direct investment is linked to the existence of treaties. That's a controversial issue. There's a lot written about it. What, is, what by the way, is clearer 
is that there's definitely no link so far empirically shown between foreign direct investment and the arbitration provision in a treaty because treaties uh, themselves have been around uh, for a limited period of time. Foreign direct investment has been around for much longer. It was alive and well before these treaties mm -hmm. were implemented. And the first generation of treaties didn't have arbitration clauses in them anyway. And then even when they did, claims didn't start coming until four or five in the 1980s, and, uh, which were the early, uh, and some of the early NAFTA claims. And then actually, we didn't start getting this as an area of active practice uh, uh, before about the year 2000. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was Jan Paulson's article in 1995 in Arbitration International entitled Arbitration Without Privity. Uh, which alerted people to this field. And if you chart from the publication of his article, the exponential rise of cases, you can see how popular <laughs> that was. So all that to say that there are reasons why, why countries are now walking away. They are fee but, the, but what's motivating them then is they don't feel they need it, but they also feel they're getting hurt by it. Um, so, uh, that, but as I say, this was not intended as a rant against investor state protection. Um, but, but my, my, my hope is that if there were a system which is acceptable to states and which was felt to be productive and positive, then that exodus would stop. And actually people would see this as being something positive um, and uh, with its own particular merits. So this whole process, you know, this whole critique of BITs, I mean, it has an impact on ordinary day-to-day -day commercial arbitration yes. and has tainted it yes. significantly. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, it, it has an effect all round for those of us who just do day-to-day yeah. -day disputes between commercial parties yeah. are being infected by this whole process. So, and and, the, and the, infection, the infection is even, is even more dispersed than that. It's mm -hmm. wider because it feeds, as, as I was trying to say, but I, it's, I, I, there was limited time, it feeds into rule of law. Mm. It feeds into the international legal order because arbitration plays such a key role in dispute resolution as part of that order. Right. Uh, one more question. Any more questions? Yes. So the gentleman there who I think has a vested interest in yes. what you're <laughs> I feel Would very, you like to stand I think and tell you us? Should, you should introduce yourself. You should introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Malcolm Raga and I made the film that... Uh, <laughs> Toby Landau referred to, which is actually live now on the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment website. It went live over the weekend. So if you're interested, you can just go on to the Columbia Center for um, Sustainable Investment website or do a search on The Tribunal Columbia, and you should be able to find it now live. So anybody can watch it now. Was that but your it, point? <laughs> no, I had a question, actually. I had a genuine question, which was, um, uh, I know that the answer is, is that it's hard. I know that. But I'd kind of like to go find out a little bit further beyond, well, it's really hard to do that. But uh, you talked about the last part of your lecture. You said that the people in the, the local people in Intag should be able to understand the process mm -hmm. and should be able to converse about it mm -hmm. in an educated, informed way, and they should be able to understand it. You also talked about fair and equitable treatment and how there's a lack of clarity or a lack of direction about what that standard really means and that it's almost a up for grabs in, in some ways, particularly because of the lack of precedent in the system. So it's hard to point to a hierarchy of decisions in terms of interpreting fair and equitable mm -hmm. treatment and what it means going forward. So how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile where at its <laughs> core in the system, there's this lack of clarity? In a sense, you talked about the rule of, you talked about that in reference to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. It's a rule-based system where the rules are not clear. Yeah. So how do we get to the point of the, object, the goal that you stated at the end of your lecture where the people who are affected, in this case, mm -hmm. in the community, understand the process? Mm. There seems to be a big yeah. uh, <laughs> wide no, it's a, it's a, a very, there. How, yeah. do you, how do we get there? Yeah, very, a very, very interesting question. 
my, my feeling is you have to separate substance from process. So when, you, when I talk about the fact it's rules-based but the rules are not clear, that is substance. It's not unlike, it's no different to the rest of international law. So international law, it's not just the investor state that doesn't have precedent. International law doesn't have the hierarchy, doesn't have precedent. So international law, customer international law, the, all elements of it work in this somewhat nebulous way. It's different in its approach and analysis to domestic law. If I explain to anybody, uh, uh, you know, an area, not investor state, some other area of international law, I will be saying similar things, actually. There is this principle, but it's interpreted in different ways. It's grown up in this way. Some people have this view. It's got that flavor to it. That's all substance, and that's an inevitability. There's inevitability about it because of the nature of international law. Process is different. Process is, whatever that substance is, how does it get applied? And when it's applied, how do people understand it? What's happened? So the short answer to your question is, that person in Ecuador should be able to say on camera, we, we had a process. It was told to us that these were the considerations that were taken into account. And it was told to us why they were taken into account. And we had our chance to say what had happened to us. And we understood that that was interpreted in the following way. That's process. It doesn't change the substance, the nature of international law. So I think it's reconcilable in that way. It's just a question of, uh, of actually improving, changing the process so it enfranchises the people who are actually affected. I think that is a very good place to finish. Uh, we've overrun the time, but I think, you know, if you had the four hours, I'm sure you'd have plenty <laughs> more to say. Uh, one of the most interesting and informative lectures we've had for some time. Uh, nothing against our previous, but really interesting, Toby, as ever. And uh, I'm delighted. And would you thank Toby in the usual fashion? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.